Okay, so uh, this morning's session is on, uh, is on uh, hot or not. We're not. It's not a website where we, uh, where we rate these guys for their uh, philosophical genius out of 10. Um, it's in fact about the, uh, the uh, higher order thought theory of consciousness, something which has been uh, very active in philosophical discussions of consciousness over the last few decades and has also increasingly uh, become connected to issues in the science of consciousness. Now, uh, this is set up in uh, debate format. The original idea was we'd have two philosophers and two neuroscientists, one pro, one con, from uh, each, uh, each group, each side. Now, as you see, we don't have four uh, participants here. We have three. Um, sadly, Victor Lama couldn't make it. He had a family emergency back in the Netherlands and couldn't come. But uh, heroically, uh, Ned Block has agreed to step up and play both roles. The, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, philo the, the philosopher and the neuroscientist, uh, having some, uh, some expertise on both. So uh, the way we're going to set it up is that uh, David Rosenthal will go first. Um, so on the pro higher order thought side, uh, 25 minutes. Then Ned will respond on the philosophical issues for 15 minutes or so. Then we'll have uh, Hakwan go for uh, 25 minutes. Then we'll have um, Ned, response, Ned respond on the neuroscience issues for 15 minutes or so. And we'll have a few questions along the way, open it up for discussion. Hopefully, we should have time for a good, uh, healthy airing of all the relevant uh, issues. Um, so uh, David Rosenthal, someone who needs no introduction at this uh, conference, has been uh, many times. I think first time was back in 96. Um, He's really the, uh, you know, the originator and prime mover of the, uh, the higher order theory of consciousness in many uh, important publications over uh, the last, gosh, uh, 30 odd years now, since, uh, since the 80s when uh, the early work was uh, developed. And he's um, just developed into an extremely systematic um, theory with consciousness, with application to uh, um, pretty well any issue you like in the philosophy of consciousness, and then also being increasingly connected to issues in the science of consciousness. So recently, uh, David and Hakwan had an article come out in Trends in Cognitive Science on neurobiological issues concerning the higher order theory of consciousness. And he's, David's also been a prime mover in the philosophy and science of consciousness through all the work he's done with graduate students, you know, many of whom are here, through his work in organizing many activities in, in New York City, and so on. So it's a pleasure to have him here today to kick off the, uh, the pro higher order thought side with a talk called uh, Conscious Awareness, Higher Order Theories, and Overflow. So please welcome David Rosenthal. Is this coming? Yes, good. Thank you very much, Dave. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, all explaining. I'm going to argue, must be based on a reliable, accurate description of the phenomena that we want to explain. Otherwise, our explanation may simply miss those target phenomena. Um, I originally, in a slide, had a quotation from Tom Nagel to this effect, because I thought it would be good to have somebody disagreeing with me from uh, the other side, the polar disagreement, uh, making the same point. Scientific theorizing does often lead us to revise our take on the phenomena. So, for example, uh, it used to be perhaps that we thought that weight was an intrinsic property. We came to realize that it's a relative property. But regardless of this revising of common sense notions that sometimes takes place, we still have to take care to ensure that our explanations address the phenomena under consideration. In the case of conscious states, that means explaining how mental states that are conscious differ from mental states that are not conscious. Otherwise, we won't have said why it is that the conscious ones are conscious. This is a constraint on any type of theory of what it is for a state to be conscious. But this constraint on theories generally, we'll see, motivates higher order theories in particular, so that's what I'm going to turn to now. It won't do simply to say that we know perfectly well what conscious states are from the inside, so to speak, from the first person. 
because that won't capture the contrast between being conscious and not being conscious. Experience is no substitute for articulate description. A neuromarker that occurs only when states are conscious, the famous NCC, can be highly useful. But even such a marker cannot by itself explain why those states are conscious. We must also say why our neuromarker results in states being conscious and why mental states aren't conscious when the neuromarker is absent. Compare, we have to say not only that we have a macroscopic object that has a certain atomic structure, we have to say why having that atomic structure results in the distinctive macroscopic properties. Neuromarkers may point to mechanisms in virtue of which some mental states are conscious and others not. But we still have to explain why it's those mechanisms that result in a state's being conscious. That is to say, how those mechanisms make the difference between a state's being conscious and its not being conscious. We often get a useful handle on what a phenomenon consists in by seeing what's missing when the phenomenon is absent. That works well with consciousness. The salient mark of a mental state that fails to be conscious is that the individual who's in the state is altogether unaware of that state. If we have a reason to think that a subject is in a mental state, but that subject sincerely denies being in it, then the state is not conscious. We need sincere denial in order to indicate lack of awareness of the state. This implies that a state's being conscious requires that one be in some way aware of being in that state. And, and that's the core of any higher order theory of consciousness. Higher order theories hold that a state is conscious only if one is in some way aware of the state. Higher order theories differ among themselves about what that particular way is. On my own higher order thought theory, one is aware of one con one's conscious state by having a thought that one is in that state. That higher order thought need not itself be conscious, and to capture the subjective immediacy of the way we're aware of conscious states, the higher th order thought must not seem subjectively to rely on any inference or observation. But despite the elegant title of our session, uh, Hot or Not, I'm going to be discussing high order theories generally and the higher order awareness that they posit. And I'm not going to focus specifically on my own higher order thought theory. First order theories of consciousness, like Ned's, see a state's being conscious as independent of any substantive higher order awareness of the state. Um, the word substantive matters here. I'll come back to that in a moment. First order theories vary among themselves in the accounts that they give. Fred Dretzky, for example, provides a certain psychological account. Ned, as I understand him, provide, prefers a neural mark. But whatever the account, whether neural or psychological, the account must explain how it is that mental states that are conscious differ from mental states that are not. Mere co-occurrence of a preferred feature with the states that we count as conscious is not enough, unless that preferred feature also explains why the feature makes the difference between the states being conscious and it's not being conscious. One might urge that the higher order awareness that occurs with conscious states is not substantive, that it's in a certain way trivial. Maybe being conscious of a conscious state is like smiling a smile. This is an idea um, due to Ernie Sosa uh, that Ned has sometimes endorsed. But smiling a smile is simply smiling. So it can't provide a contrast like the contrast that we need between a mental state's being conscious and it's not being conscious. 
And I think that no such deflationary account of the higher order awareness can explain how conscious states differ from mental states that are not conscious. For that, we need a substantive awareness of the state. More on that in a moment. High order theories do not conflict with finding neural markers of mental states being conscious. Indeed, they may very well help guide the search for um, an NCC. That's because of the constraint that high order theories place that's a bad sentence. That, that's because the, the constraint that I've been talking about um, that I think any theory must meet. And so the NCC itself has to meet that constraint. High order theories reflect the observation that no state is conscious unless one is in some way aware of it. So a satisfactory NCC should point to or provide a mechanism that subserves or gives rise to that higher order awareness. Hakwan and I have argued that uh, prefrontal cortex is likely implicated in any such mechanism, but on this occasion, I'm going to defer to Hakwan uh, for the neural specifics. Instead, I'm going to turn to saying a bit more about why it is that higher order theories do constrain the search for the NCC. Why can't the search for a neural correlate of consciousness proceed altogether independently of the issues that divide higher order from first order theories? A state's being conscious is a psychological phenomenon. So a merely neural marker won't do unless it points to a psychological way in which conscious states differ from mental states that are not conscious. A neural correlate that explains why we're aware of mental states when they are conscious, but not otherwise, does satisfy that condition. But first order theories which preclude appeal to being aware of conscious states, at least in any substantive way, arguably lack resources to explain in psychological terms how conscious states differ from mental states that are not conscious. Why is that? Why can't first order theories explain that difference in psychological terms? Some first order, some people who hold first order theories uh, think, in fact, they can explain the difference. Since first order theories deny substantive higher order awarenesses, the only remaining psychological properties are those such as representational content, mental qualities, and attentiveness. And none of those helps, since they all occur with non-conscious states as well as occurring with conscious states. Non-conscious thoughts exhibit intentional content. Non-conscious mental qualities occur in cases like mask priming and other versions of subliminal perception. And uh, with a nod to yesterday's session on attention and particularly Bob Kentridge's presentation, attention also occurs with non-conscious states. So there's no first order account, or at least so I'm arguing, there's no first order account of a state's being conscious that's cast in distinctively psychological terms. For that, higher order thoughts are arguably the only game in town. So some objections. Many theorists see consciousness as an inseparable aspect of qualitative states such as perceptions. But I think it's arguable that qualitative states can and do occur without being conscious. Subliminal perceptions, for example, those in masked cases, are not conscious in any ordinary sense. Nonetheless, such states evidently exhibit mental qualities. And my argument for this is that we distinguish subliminal states in respect of the very same qualitative features, say color and pitch for audition and so forth, the very same qualitative features figure in distinguishing subliminal states as figure in distinguishing among conscious qualitative states. So subliminal states, it seems, have qualitative character, and indeed we treat them as though they do. Since subliminal states do exhibit qualitative properties, is there something it's like 
perhaps something it's like for one to be in subliminal states. Do those states exhibit phenomenal consciousness? Uh, I confess I'm not sure, I think both these phrases, what it's like in phenomenal consciousness, have uh, wandered around a very great deal uh, in uh, the last 20 to 30 years in terms of how they apply, but I'm just going to push ahead. If subliminal states do exhibit something it's like to something it's like and phenomenal consciousness, then those notions of something it's like and phenomenal consciousness extend well beyond any ordinary notion of consciousness. People in subliminal states sincerely deny being in those states. So I think it's at best quixotic to regard those states as conscious. Intuitively, there is simply nothing it's like for one to be in such states. Since we do characterize subliminal states qualitatively, first order qualitative states can occur without phenomenal consciousness and without there being any what it's likeness. Uh, and I take that from Ned's analysis article last summer, that phrase in quotes. So those properties can't be an inseparable aspect of first order states. Ned denies this holding that phenomenal consciousness and what its likeness are aspects of first order qualitative states. At least that's my understanding of Ned's view. And subjectively it does seem as though that is the case. But our explanations must look past the subjective appearances. The high order awareness is rarely itself a conscious state. We are seldom aware of being aware of a conscious state perhaps only in the very special case of introspecting, which I won't be talking about today. Since we are typically unaware of any higher order state, it will seem subjectively that there's only one state, namely the first order state. So the property of that state's being conscious will seem, again, subjectively seem, to be an aspect of that one state, to be an aspect of just the first order state. High order theories can explain our subjective sense that the property of being conscious is inseparable from first order qualitative states. And we also have reason not to trust that subjective sense. Our best psychological handle on how conscious states differ from non-conscious mental states is that a higher order awareness accompanies the conscious states but not the ones that are not conscious. Any acceptable theory must, of course, do justice to the subjective appearances. But there are two ways to do that. There is one strategy of doing justice to the subjective appearances where you simply say the subjective appearances are the way it really is. And that's not the only way to do justice to the subjective appearances. There's a second and I think better way of doing justice to them. We can do justice to them by explaining why it is that we have those subjective appearances. And that's what we do with many, many other phenomena such as weight. We don't take our pre-theoretical conception of weight to be veridical, we explain why we have that pre-theoretical conception. And we're going to have to explain why we have, this is back to consciousness, uh, in the case of the subjective appearances, we're going to have to explain why we have those subjective appearances. And supposing that the subjective appearances are veridical or accurate, isn't going to help us give such an explanation. This bears on an objection that Ned and others, I should say very many others, have raised. Namely, that high order theories don't preclude a higher order awarenesses occurring without any first order state that's relevant to the higher order awareness. That is to say, without the first order state that the higher order awareness makes one aware of being in. Uh, I have to confess, I've never seen that this can really be much of a worry, right? Higher order theories don't require that this ever actually happens. 
So if it turns out that we establish that it can't happen, we can just add a stipulation that it can't happen. And this is not ad hoc. This would just reflect what we have discovered, namely that it can't happen. But I think it can. Uh, at least I think it's unclear why a higher order awareness cannot occur without the first order states be that one is aware of oneself as being in. It seems subjectively that that can't happen. But that shows it, it's seeming, it seemingly it seeming subjectively that it can happen shows that it really can't happen only if we assume that the mind is transparent to itself, uh, which I think is still uh, a more common assumption than many theorists are inclined to acknowledge, uh, but seems highly implausible. And it will appear subjectively that higher order awarenesses cannot occur without their being, without their targets, since actually on a higher order theory, the higher order awareness is an a subjective appearance that one is in the relevant first order state. So it's going to appear that way if you just have the higher order awareness without any first order state. If what it's likeness were an aspect of the first order state, as Ned holds, then there would be nothing it's like without a first order state. And that, as I understand it, is the basis of his analysis article last summer. But if one is altogether unaware of being in that state, then there will be nothing it's like for one to be in it. So having a higher order awareness is at least necessary for there being something it's like, and barring an appeal to the transparency of the mind to itself, I think it's also sufficient for there to be something that it's like. And as noted earlier, we can explain our subjective sense we can explain our subjective sense that what its likeness is an inseparable aspect of first order states simply because we're un unaware of most higher order awarenesses. But if a higher order awareness does occur without a relevant first order state, what is the conscious state? It's not the first order state since by hypothesis that's missing. And the higher order awareness, as I keep saying, is seldom itself a conscious state. Doesn't this show that the first order state must occur? It can't fail to occur because we have to have something that's going to count as the conscious state. No, I don't think so. Consciousness is mental appearance. What matters for consciousness is simply how our mental lives appear to us subjectively. A theory of consciousness has to explain that. So conscious states are simply the mental states that we appear subjectively to be in, even if occasionally we're not actually in them. Ned has argued in a different article that perceptual consciousness overflows cognitive access. Actually, uh, I'm referring to a Tix article uh, from last year but he's argued this in a number of places. And he appeals to George Sperling's work and also to Victor Lama's work. It's very sad that Victor can't be with us himself, but Ned will represent Victor's work. Uh, and he, he, Ned appeals to that work to argue that there is more, that's, to argue that more is phenomenally conscious than we actually access in a cognitive way. Ned is going to discuss these results in detail. I'm just going to very quickly describe Sperling's work and make a few comments. Sperling presented subjects very briefly with a three by four matrix of letters. After the letters have disappeared, subjects can identify only three to four letters spread out among the 12. But if a subsequent tone directs subjects to one row, so the letters appear, they disappear, then there's a tone after the disappearance. Then subjects get most of the letters in that row. Since the tone occurs only after the letters have disappeared, subjects must somehow retain the relevant information. And the question is, how do they retain it? Ned argues that they retain it consciously, appealing to Victor's work. 
My comments on Sperling will, I believe, also apply to Victor's work and to Ned's arguments. Sperling's subjects report having conscious perceptions of all 12 letters. But some theorists have urged that these conscious perceptions are in some way generic. For example, uh, conscious perceptions of some letter or other, but not a specific letter. Or perhaps that the conscious perceptions are fragmentary, pieces of letters, but not the whole one, not the, not the whole letter. The perceptions would then not overflow our rather limited cognitive access. Ned doubts that conscious perceptions are ever generic or fragmentary. But high order theory suggests that they may very well be generic or fragmentary. I myself am more drawn to the generic idea, but either one. Even if the first order perceptions could not be generic or fragmentary, I'm not conceding that, but even if that were true, that the first orders perceptions couldn't be generic or fragmentary, the higher order awareness might still make one aware of the first order perception in a fragmentary or generic way. The perceptions would be conscious as being fragmentary or generic. That's one point. Subjects also report that they consciously see, quote, more than they can con cognitively grasp. Uh, that's Ned's summary of these conscious report, of these subjects' reports. And quoting from a BBS commentary uh, by Sperling in 83, uh, subjects report that they saw more than they remembered. And Ned argues that this helps confirm that the perceptions that overflow cognitive access are conscious. Subjects say they are. But these reports may be indicating something different altogether. They may just reflect subjects' assumptions that the display that's out there, the objective display that they're presented with, contained more than they can identify, and so more than they were consciously aware of. They may just be assuming that the display had specific letters that they couldn't identify, and this would be an extremely reasonable assumption for them to make. Conscious awareness would then coincide with cognitive access, that is to say, it would coincide with what subjects can describe and identify. Those who deny overflow sometimes urge that conscious perception is sparse, less rich than it seems. Ned insists that it's rich. Perceptions could be rich or sparse in two distinct ways. I've been suggesting that perhaps the first order perceptions are in themselves rich, but we're aware of them in a sparse way, that our higher order awarenesses represent them sparsely. But it might be that the first order perceptions are also less rich than we subjectively think, independent of how we're subjectively aware of them. The first order perceptions might not be as rich as we think. For example, paraphobial vision is very much less rich than it seems subjectively to be. We likely do, I think, subjectively overestimate the detail we objectively see. That is to say, in a first order way, um, appealing to uh, somebody that Hakwan has uh, uh, worked with in his lab. If so, we have even less reason to hold that conscious perceiving overflows cognitive access. Thank you very much. Okay, so David, we have a. So we have um, we have time to take one or two questions. Oh, yes. one or two questions. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Jesse. I, it's over there. Uh, uh, thanks, David. Uh, so I need to get in here. So I want to ask you to Can I stand? I'll just stand here. Uh, let me, the people behind you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. So I wanted to ask you about the notion of explanation and work in the first part of your talk. Right. Um, First order theories, you suggested that first order theories uh, are not in a good position to explain. Just one thought. Just a quick question. 
Yeah, it's, well, it's, 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 it's one question. Uh, you said the first order theories are not in a position to explain awareness, but you didn't mention availability theories, which seem to be in a good position to explain awareness, whereas higher order theories fail by your own standard of explanation, which is the possibility of having the, the state instantiated without awareness. After all, we can have lots of higher order thoughts without awareness. It's a particular kind of higher order thought that matters for awareness. So the explanation is sort of at another level of analysis, which opens up a large family of first order theories, uh, which posit special changes at the first order that might be correlated with awareness. OK, that's not a quick okay. <laughs> yeah, question. And it can't have a quick answer, but I'll give a quick answer. Uh, uh, availability theories, uh, for example, somebody might construe attention as the gateway to working memory. Uh, uh, you yourself. Uh, seeing attention as the gateway to working memory, this is uh, at the neural level. This isn't really a psychological level explanation, as I think. So uh, when we have more questions, we ha we're going to have plenty of time. Uh, why don't you ask that again, and I'll give you a fuller answer, but okay. that's the quick version. Other quick questions? Um, I see one at the back. Not so quick to get there. Thanks. Uh, yes, uh, your, your entire argument rests on the premise that unconscious states exist. Uh, yes. for, for instance, I'm not aware of your consciousness, and yet I have every reason to believe you are conscious. So my question is, if polypsychism were demonstrated, do you if, agree if, that- I'm sorry, if what were demonstrated? Polypsychism, the notion that all of our supposedly unconscious states are in fact conscious, but just not us, but other individuals, do you agree that your arguments would fall apart? I have no idea what to say. Uh, okay, <laughs> so could you maybe stand over there? I'm just worried that the spill on this. Right. Um, why don't you put this over? Uh, I have no idea what to say about that. I guess I was assuming that we have something like a common sense phenomenon of uh, mental states, thoughts, perceptions, sensations, and so forth, and that we have perhaps a slightly less common sense conception of what it is for those states to be conscious. And it is an interesting fact that's often overlooked that the description of mental states as being conscious is, relatively speaking, a neologism as these things go. Uh, that, bef at least in English, uh, before the last quarter of the 19th century, uh, that phrase was almost never used, that the um, big guys that we talk, to, uh, talk about, like Locke and Descartes, who were very long dead, never used the phrase conscious state, conscious thought, anything like that, always immediately conscious of. Uh, so I take it that we have a kind of contrast between states that we're aware of being and states that we have third-person evidence that we're in, despite are not being aware of being in them. And that was all I was addressing myself to. And there could be all sorts of theories about how that works that uh, might undercut what I was saying. But I was just starting with that common sense uh, setup. OK, we'll take one more quick one over here. Thank you. Yes, I'm not very good at the spurling task but I've given it frequently to my psychology students, and, oh, they're very, and they tend to be very good at it. The very fact that in the partial report, you hear the tone 15, maybe even 30 seconds after it goes off, the fact that they can come up with 75% or whatever of whichever role they're doing suggests that they're seeing much more than just fragments or generic letters. Uh, again, I'm not very good at it, so I can't give a first hand, but, my, but I, can, I can say uh, my students uh, tend to be very good at that. It suggests much more than just fragmentary things. So I, I, think, I think on that one, Ned's got you. Uh, it, well, I don't know about that. Uh, uh, I was talking about two ways of being fragmentary and generic. 
and what I was saying in connection specifically with Sperling is that they could be complete and not fragmentary, not generic at a first order level, but not consciously. And you could be aware of these first order states in a fragmentary or generic way. So I don't think Ned has me quite yet. Okay, so let's thank David again.